So let's start with some group questions. So I want you to raise your hand if you believe this to be true. So please raise your hand if you believe classroom disruptions are at a crisis level. Everybody. Okay, raise your hand if you've had to clear a classroom in the last year. Okay. Raise your hand if you believe you have enough support in your school. No one. Okay, um, raise your hand if you believe you're able to effectively handle these classroom disruptions. No one. Okay. It's um, work on it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a mixed kind it's of process. Got it. You do the best you can with what you have. Mm -hmm. That's right. mm -hmm. You do the best you can with what you have. Right. We don't really have a choice, so you have to do that. Okay. And raise your hand if you believe that the current laws allow you to deal with these disruptions in the best way. No one. Okay. So let's start with, so you all believe classroom disruptions are at crisis levels. That is not an overstatement. No. 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 So let's start, okay, Cindy, mm -hmm. what have you experienced? Tell me what, parents don't know this is happening. A lot of people in the community don't know. Tell me about okay. some experiences sure. you've had. Some of the things that happened at my school are students just running through the hallway. Um, our school d did not have all like walls and doors and so st students could run in and out of classrooms. Um, students hitting staff, hitting other kids. Um, just just generally unable to teach. We're unable to teach because there's so much behavior, sometimes from the beginning, the morning till the end. A student might be off as soon as I see them, the first thing, perhaps a student might be off. I've seen that. Okay, mm -hmm. and tell me, uh, Jenny, give me something that's happened in your class well, or your school. I do feel fortunate that at my school, we have not had a room clear except in our um, special ed, but that is a, a unique situation. But I've talked with many colleagues around my school district in which um, at one school I know a certain room had five to eight room clears in one week. And that means something in which no learning is going on mm -hmm. for the other children. Mm -hmm. Trauma is happening for the child who is upset and for the other children and for the teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's very tough. Five to eight in one week. Yes. So the entire class has to leave the room for that one student. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tracy, you have an interesting role because you are called to these schools for these disruptions, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, I work at one school and in my role I'm not assigned to a classroom. So there are um, times when there are crises going on in other classrooms and they call for assistance and help. So while a teacher may be doing a room clear with some students, I may be trying to de-escalate a student who's not regulated. And what have you seen and what have you heard? Oh, I've seen screaming, yelling, spitting, hitting, throwing items, um, students who just don't know how to communicate effectively. And it, they're communicating something to us. They're communicating um, through their behavior that something is wrong and they don't have the tools or the skills to communicate effectively. And so when a student is so escalated, you need to um, calm them down and get them to a point where they are regulated so that then you can start to reason with students. And so it does take a team to do that. A mm -hmm. teacher in a classroom by themselves cannot manage an escalated situation. So, you, so you're saying screaming, kicking, spitting, do they Throwing. Da throwing? Mm -hmm. Turning over furniture. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. Turning over furniture. Yeah. Da damage? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Damage. Uh, hurting other people? Injuries, yes. And this is regular? Yes. Yeah. And, and students running away. And I think the one thing that when I think about student behaviors and escalations, I just think so much about safety mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. students and students running through the buildings or running off campus, um, communicating that they're uncomfortable in some way and can't mm -hmm. share their feelings and what they're experiencing. And so they react. And maybe the only way they know how to react is to run. And that's scary. It's, I, you know, we just, we have, our best hearts are with the students and we want to keep them safe. And so I think that's where I think all of us can agree that um, 
those escalated behaviors are, are on a rise and we don't have the staffing to respond to all of the needs. Okay, and Melanie, tell me what you've seen in your school and what you've heard from other teachers in, in terms of incidents. Well, being a kindergarten teacher, you get kids coming in and you don't have the background history on them. And so as they enter your classroom, if they have unmet needs, if they have behaviors that um, aren't as like the typical classmate, uh, we're just trying to be a problem solver and a detective to find out how to best support their needs. And in, with the lack of funding, we have lack of staffing. And really, we need a lot of staff at the beginning of the year to really try to uh, respond and meet the needs of these little ones that come in with some of those lagging skills. And uh, that's why we're always working on just getting more school funding because our ultimate ask is we want the funding to support students so that they can be successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what our big thing is. And uh, we want them safe, we want them learning, we want the whole classroom learning, but we want the little child that comes in with those lagging behavioral skills, that lagging locus of control, they don't know how to react in a big community. Uh, we want to be able to have those support staff to meet their needs. Right. Okay. And what can you share, uh, Jenny? Jenny, uh, what, what you've seen in your own classrooms or at your school? Really, in the last several years, I've seen so many kids who come in who are deeply impacted by the trauma in their lives. Our district has so many students who face poverty and homelessness and unstable home life situations. And in my opinion, school needs to be the safe haven for them. It needs to be that place where no matter what is going on in your life, you're okay at school and we're here for you. What I'm seeing is a lot of those kids have those unmet needs. There's no one in their life who's able to teach them how to communicate what they're feeling. And so when they feel stressed out or upset or any other number of feelings, they take it out in different ways, like running off campus and we're trying to herd elementary schoolers out of the streets to keep them safe. We've seen students hurting other students or throwing other belongings. I've also seen students who take it the complete opposite way and shut down. Mm -hmm. And they become an island of one that is almost impenetrable. Mm -hmm. They hide behind furniture, under desks, and they are so reluctant to communicate with you because they have no trust that adults yeah. will be there for them. Mm -hmm. And so having people in our school who can build relationships with those kids and really help them prove to these children that school is that safe place, that we want them to be there, we want them to be successful, is really the key to that. And that's where I believe that having more people in our school to support those students would be the biggest benefit we could have. Kristen, we've talked on the phone. Tell me about some of the things you've experienced in your classroom. So for me, it's a lot of what has already been said, but a huge issue is kids coming in that are impacted by trauma and um, mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm at you know the primary level, and so we're seeing kids that are not able to express how they're feeling besides literal screaming, like they're screaming for help, literally. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that comes out in you know suicide threats or death mm -hmm. threats, and we know that you know that they might not truly understand the complexity of that, but we know that that speaks obvious volumes to what they're experiencing and the fact that they don't know what to do with those emotions or feelings. Um, with the current support, you know, I personally have no aid in my classroom, and that is a huge issue, and I would say one of the biggest issues, especially primary faces these days, is that we have such little, tiny, you know, minds to meld, and we need more support. We need highly qualified people in those positions, which are often not incentivized positions. So they are revolving doors. They're not stable for our kids. Our kids don't see the same people sometimes because honestly, the, the wage that is getting paid to some of the positions is very, very low. So they also need to work um, at the legislative level to make sure that we're fully funded because right now, oftentimes we get grant money and that's over and gone in a year, maybe two. There goes that position, there goes that support, there goes that, child, that child's you know, maybe only connection that they made out the door. So um, that's really been a thing for us is that we wanna make sure that legislat legislators hear us loud and clear. I invite them into my school, I invite them to my district. I want them to see on the ground what's happening at a daily, you know, on a daily basis. I want them to see that this is absolutely 100% necessary to have more support staff, particularly in the younger years. We also need to definitely hone in on primary education before they get to kindergarten mm -hmm. because that's another piece of it is that we need to address the social emotional issues that are at hand with um, wraparound services as well for our families and make sure that we're 
ac that we're addressing the core issues because when they come into us, they're not accessing their education if they haven't had have their basic needs met. Mm -hmm. You know, shelter, like um, just love, you know. There's just so many issues that have need to be addressed that aren't being addressed. So how can we expect to teach a kid that's just not, that's hungry? And you're saying screaming. They, they, they scream and, and suicide and death threats and you all shook your heads, mm -hmm. yes. That this is a normal occurrence, and what do they do? They say it in class. They they have said it in front of an entire class, and mm -hmm. that goes that speaks to what you know some of the teachers were saying earlier, and that it traumatizes other kids. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to di yeah. digest that information. They hear a death threat or a suicide threat, and while you know we don't know how they're taking it, and they might not think that it's actually credible or serious, they've heard something that's pretty heavy, and they might go home and talk about it and. I don't know what's being said at home, but I think that for you know five, six, seven-year-old, that's very intense, and I really worry about the mental health of the rest of my classroom when things like that happen. Okay, um, Tori, what have you experienced? Well, I think a lot of the same things that uh, my peers and colleagues have already said. Um, I've personally witnessed um, students uh, throwing tables over, throwing chairs at adults, at other students, wood blocks. Um, I've been called every name in the book. Um, we take a lot of verbal and physical abuse as educators. Um, and it's very difficult um, as an educator to come in every day and be regulated for your students. And I think um, we rely a lot on our colleagues to take our students during room clears or um, other times, and it's, it's draining. Um, and so there's no wonder that there is a huge um, uh, lack of educators in the field currently, and we're seeing more and more teachers not going into the field because of what's going on. Um, and we're, a lot of us are trained. We go to trainings to deal with these things, but it's hard when you're in the classroom by yourself to actually mm -hmm. put those things into effect. Um, and so have you had to do room clears? Oh, yes. A, a lot? Uh, there were, uh, it varies by class, um, you know, some years you don't do any and then some years you're doing two a week. And so what, ha to, what is a room clear? Uh, a room clear is pretty much where a student is so dysregulated that your students are not safe. Um, and so I've done room clears when uh, other students were tossing chairs um, at kids just because they couldn't control their emotions and they didn't know how to um, convey what they were needing. Um, and so I told my students we need to get up and we need to go into the teacher next door and to her classroom. And when I'm by myself, I just tell my students to walk in and the other teacher will know what it means. And it's gotten to the point where you see a classroom coming and you just know what it means. When you do a classroom clear out, talk about the loss of learning. Is there any learning being done? No. And by that point leading up to that, you're doing everything in your toolkit to regulate that child before you go to a room clear. And so you could have lost 15, 20 minutes more of learning time. Um, and during that process, you're trying your best to stay regulated for your student, but you're also becoming um, anxiety ridden. And, uh, you know, because you, you are trying everything. And um, sometimes it feels like, um, like you're not good enough if you have to do a room clear because uh, you can't get that student regulated. And Tori, when you have to do these classroom clear outs, so if a student is flipping out, mm -hmm. you cannot touch them? Is that correct? I mean, by law, you cannot touch them in any way. That's correct. Does Unless that... they're about to inflict um, physical harm on themselves, um, then you know you might want to try to go in and, and calm them down as best as you can, but really no, no touching whatsoever. And that's what leads to the hurting. Yes. When you're, the kids yes. are in the street. We do a lot of hurting. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of hurting. Does it work? Not often. They try to run around you. Um, they crawl under you. They hit you. That's usually when a lot of the physical aggression occurs, um, is when you're trying to kind of guide them somewhere. You're all shaking your head. Mm -hmm. So when you're hurting these students, they try to crawl under you or they hurt you. Yes. Well, they see it as a game and mm -hmm. so for yes. a lot of these children now you're playing chase with them and instead of having to learn they get to run around in the location of their choice. Okay. Um, Melinda, tell me what you've seen in the classroom or you've experienced. Again, much of the same things we've already heard. Um, I have had students who have screamed and yelled profanities at me and other students in the classroom and have been so agitated and angry that they um, run around the room pulling tubs of books off shelves like 
and throwing them across the floor and clearing tabletops, um, including my teacher tabletop and my laptop onto the floor. So destroying personal property. Um, and that's a situation that would cause a room clear because student, other students in the room are unsafe. Mm -hmm. um, flipping over desks, tipping chairs, those types of behaviors that are um, impossible to control when a student is that dysregulated and it's um, really frightening to the other children in the class. And these are young, some of you teach young kids. Right? Six and seven year olds. Five and six, six and seven. Yeah. And these are not the special need. Now some of these are special needs, but the, the, you guys are not special needs teachers. These are general education classrooms. We're kids that come in unidentified, so that's part of our job, especially as kindergarten teachers. I feel like we're detectives, we're gatekeepers, we're, we're looking at our little ones that are coming in and assessing any lagging needs they have, lagging skills they have. And so that's one of the challenges as a kindergarten teacher. And that's one thing where it would be really great to have that extra support because then we can be proactive instead of reactive. Because right now I feel like in our field we're really having to be reactive. Uh, we have to just uh, react to whatever situations are in front of us. And how much better would it be for the student and their success if we could be proactive and have all those people in place, have mental health people, have counselors in place so that we're not having to pull staff from their other assigned jobs because that's what's happening right now. Principals are being pulled you know, into, from their regular jobs, other assistants, uh, counselors. counselors, secretaries, and so they're not able to do their own job. And so that's what we're looking for is just more support so that we can meet all these kids' needs. Yeah, do you feel like there are enough mental health counselors in these schools? No. no. And all of our counselors are overloaded. They have much larger caseload that's, that, than that is um, suggested. Um, at the local and national level, I believe, also. And so all of that kind of boils down to funding. Absolutely. Because some of our elementary costs. schools don't even have full time counselors in the building, mm -hmm. some have so, zero. Right, like a counselor who may, maybe is half time in one building, half time in another building. Yeah. So they're only there a few hours of the day or a couple days a week. But if an incident happens on a day when the counselor is not in the building, the administrator or building secretaries or someone else has to step in and try to handle the situation. And this is not a, you're saying this happens a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yes. Daily. Absolutely. Oh, daily. Around the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every day. Every, Every day. day. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have coaches that are supposed to be helping the teachers teach and instead they're almost 100% time of the time working with, uh, with kids that are off, can't, can't manage themselves in the school environment. So, you know, a lot of it is if we, if an aide is available to take over your class, then you can maybe spend the time to de develop the relationships and talk to that student and find out what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times you can't even leave your classroom be to deal with a student that's out of control because who's going to manage it? You, there isn't anybody else there. So much or, of what we, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So much of what we do is based on relationships with our students. Absolutely. That's and the number one thing. It's really difficult to build a relationship with a student mm -hmm. who's dysregulated, who doesn't trust adults That's or right. teachers, um, or even with other students in the class yes. when your attention is focused on a student who you're trying to keep, keep regulated. Right. Mm -hmm. I have seen some efforts in my school district in terms of hiring more social workers. Um, our counselors are, I believe, all full time. And we've um, hired student success coaches, um, which is a person who is coming to the school to teach us about um, regulation, the zones of regulation. Mm -hmm. And um, but it's not enough. She's half time. She's between you know two schools. Mm -hmm. And again, to build a relationship, to build a relationship with our children, you need to have time with them. Mm -hmm. And so when they are off doing these other things, you don't, you don't have that time. Okay, uh, have you seen students physically hurt? Yes. yes. Have, have you have. seen students physically hurt other students? Yes. 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 Have you seen a teacher physically hurt? I, yes. 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 What is that like? It's traumatizing Scary. to see yes. your Scary. colleagues yeah. upset. Yeah. Yeah. It's traumatizing for other kids to see yes. you being physically yes. harmed. Yes. Have e any of you been hurt? I've been punched and kicked, and uh, I've had colleagues bitten, uh, slapped, mm -hmm. scratched. Uh, yeah, scratched with punched. finger fingernail. I've had fingernail marks down my arm. I had a student that was um, up on top of a file cabinet, was throwing pennies at everybody that walked by. 
Um, another student, um, uh, I've heard of a student who grabbed, went into a, a classroom and grabbed, a, must have been like a plastic bat and a yardstick and was swinging it mm -hmm. in the hallway. So these kind of things happen. I know they happen. I haven't seen them actually, but I know that that has happened. And I don't think it's intentional. I don't think the students no. want to hurt someone. They just don't know how to communicate their feelings. And so their behavior, they'll grab anything that they can right. and react with it. But it's not, it, I, I, I don't want to feel like we're blaming students no, or, no, no, or no. we I'm care so much about these I kids. Do. And mm -hmm. so when they're, um, when they're escalated, they do react in ways that you wouldn't anticipate. And so you may get scratched or kicked or yelled at or sworn at, or, um, but it's de-escalating um, de the situation and getting to the point where you can reason with that student and talk to them. And at the end, most likely, the students will say, I am so sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. Mm -hmm. They really are, they're sweet, innocent little children who have experienced trauma or um, have an adverse home life um, that they need help and they need supports. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like at, at some of our schools we have enough support. And one thing we work on is repairing the relationship with the students. So we want them to have the relationship with the rest of the class, even after yes, there's an incident. Yes. So we all work very hard to make sure that that child is welcomed back into the class community. That's an important piece of, of all of this escalation and de-escalation. Um, Tori, you, have you been injured? Yeah, I've been slapped on the face before trying to get a student um, away from in front of school buses and things like that. Uh, has it gotten worse over the last few years? Yes. You talk to professionals that were, you know, that come in and substitute that were retired teachers, mm -hmm. and a lot of them won't return to substituting because it has gotten so extreme that they they don't feel safe coming in to substitute, mm -hmm. and they comment that it has gotten um, worse over the years for sure. Any long time teachers? I mean, yeah. I've, I've taught yeah. kindergarten since the mid '90s, and I've definitely seen a change and dealing with things I, I never would have imagined dealing with. Um, I'll never forget the first time a, a student cussed, you know, it, mm -hmm. said that, drop the F-bomb, you know, at, at recess. That was shocking because um, we've just seen kind of a sea change in some of the behaviors coming in and, and it's just, it's really sad. That's really uh, where I am as an educator. I want to meet the needs of these kids and, and help them be successful learners, yet I see them dealing with all kinds of other layers of issues that are making it hard for them to access that learning. And I think, I, I just wanted to put out there too, that I think that you know, we all want this to be a s sustainable, respected profession, mm -hmm. and we love what we do. That's why we're doing it, even though it's an extremely hard job. And it's really sad to me that, you know, that many people won't go into this profession because of what they're hearing, mm -hmm. you know? And so I've actually had student teachers that have, you know, were with me for a short time and said, you know, I just don't know if I can do this. Like, this is just not what I'm cut out for. Mm -hmm. And that makes me really sad. And I also want to preserve, you know, the profession. I want to be able to sustain this for the next, I, you know, 20 years, 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And at the rate I'm going now, I don't see how I couldn't burn out if I continue to feel unsupported because so many demands are put on me without having that support and continued support. Okay. Tell me about the, the current laws. How do they work? Do, do you feel like your hands are tied in dealing with these disruptive incidents? And why? I don't know if this connects to the laws necessarily, but I feel like the best way to prevent these disruptive incidents is before they start. It's so much easier to tackle the issue while the kid is becoming deregulated than it is to handle it once they're already there. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to have an individual who can check in with that child, who has a relationship with them to know what their signs are when they're starting to become escalated, and who can get the kid what they need or into the environment that's best for them before the situation blows up. And when you're alone in your classroom, one adult is not capable of doing that. You're responsible for all the learners in your room. So having additional support who could come in and know that child and work with them when they're having a hard time could prevent so many of these issues we're seeing. And I think also class size is a big deal. So if you, if you have uh, the difference between having 18 kids and 38 kids is huge. So the more students you have, 
to have to try to manage usually also the more students that you have that have trauma. I mean, it's just, it's kind of the way it is right now. It's like the more students you have, the more trauma you have. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember when I, I haven't been teaching that long, I've been teaching 13 years, but when I first started teaching I'd have maybe one or two students in a classroom that had, uh, had an unstable home life. Now I literally might have almost every child in my class has an unstable home life in some way, homeless, um, parent doesn't have a job, the, they have a variety of relationships with their, the adults in their family, they don't know who they're living with from day to day. and it's. It's, you can understand why these students have such a hard time in the environment and really trusting adults. I mean, the, the adults in their lives have, been, have not been people that they feel comfortable, they feel loved and trusted by. Maybe their teacher, maybe I'm the only person that they feel comfortable and they feel safe with. And so this is really important to me that all, each of my students feel safe. Um, tell me about schools. Um, what schools have, or have any schools done a good job in, in working on this. I think that part of what yeah. you were saying, Jenny, is early intervention. Mm -hmm. I know that in my district we're working on pre-K, mm -hmm. getting pre-K started in our school district. Early intervention, like you said, when we see these kids coming dysregulated, we know their family home life is tough. We know that they're homeless. We know that they're living in a shelter. We need to check in with them every day. Mm -hmm. We need to have lunch buddies, but we need more adults. Right. In the classroom, you need more adults, aides, counselors, everything, everything. community right. members, community members. Yes. Okay, um, what can the lawmakers do? I mean, what is the solution? What What do you want lawmakers to address this session? They need to fully fund education, oh, fully fund education, fully fund education. Full stop. Period. Fully fund it. QEM. Yeah. Yeah. We can we can the talk more from there, model. but first it has to be yep. fully funded for us to talk about anything else because we're just going to be spinning our wheels. We know how much it costs to fully fund education, and for the last 20 years, the legislature has not met that goal. They have not allocated that amount of money to education. And do you think the number one, when after fully funded, would be getting su support staff, additional support staff in your? Yes. classrooms and, and schools yes. and not just support staff but trained support yeah. staff yeah. that yeah there are um, many opportunities to receive additional education and training there's um, restorative practices and many different um, avenues to get some additional training and what's been happening is we um, get some instructional assistance or some support staff in our buildings, but they haven't had the opportunity to take these classes. And some of them are five-day classes or three-day classes. And if you don't have the funding to support the training, then you're putting unqualified people in a position to handle a situation that they're not prepared to handle. It could be downright dangerous. What do you want people at home to know? I think it's important people know that there are heroic teachers that are working hard every day and that's one thing I, I want to make sure that there's not the impression left from this that there aren't people doing good work. There are people that show up every day, they're doing their best work with what they have and they are doing it with the student's success in mind. And I just want everyone to make sure they know that. Mm -hmm. And I have to say our district has really done a good job of um, training all of us on the trauma responsive approach, right. which it really works, but it does take time. Um, and so unfortunately, so it, it takes time to get to know a student and understand their, where they're coming from and learn those skills that you need to have in order to manage this or help a student express some of those feelings. Okay. So I've talked with a lot of you before this interview and you told me, I just want to really paint a picture. I feel like we could do a better job of explaining to people at home what's happening. Like t t this isn't just a student swearing at you one time. I mean, tell me like what is happening in these classrooms? This is a day after day experience in many classrooms with um, it used to be one or two students across a school, and now it can be one or two students in every classroom who on a daily or multiple times daily um, are melting down and require response from the building administrator to come help or, or a room clear. Um, and they are throwing furniture. They're running through the building, going to the office, throwing chairs at windows. Um, and it's, it's really intense. Because these students aren't ready for 
they are na not able emotionally to handle in the regular classroom environment, then some of the students get pulled out and they actually are working one-on-one -on -one with an aide, and that aide was originally assigned to say help with small groups. So that actually impacts all the other students and the teacher because now instead of having uh, an aide come in and help me with a, a group, now I have to handle all the groups myself while this aide has to, has to manage or help a student one on one because the student is just unable to function. And then if the, they decide, well, this student needs to be in a different learning environment, there's not enough places for them to go, and so there's no place for them to go, and so we have to continue to have that one-on-one -on -one aid. And again, if we had more aids, then that wouldn't be a problem, but a lot of our resources that used to help us with teaching are now not available for that anymore. And I think the cost of alternative placements for a lot of our students is so high that our districts can't afford yes. to take these students and Agreed. give them a setting that That's is best right. for them. What else, what else do you want to add about what's happening, what's happening in the classrooms? I just want families to know the impact on learning is not just yes. on the day of that poor behavior, it carries with the students throughout their educational career. Think of that student who in kindergarten lost so many hours of instruction yes. because the teacher was busy helping those kids with high needs. Mm -hmm. By the time they reach me in fifth grade, they're lacking some fundamental skills that are multiple grade levels behind. So not only are we trying to help those kids who have those severe needs, but now there are more students acting up because they can't meet the academic demands of their grade level. And that carries with them and compounds as they grow through their educational career. I also really want parents to know that we need their voices mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. because even though they may think that or may not know how to get involved, oftentimes parent voices are much louder than ours at a district level. So we've seen parents accomplish big tasks that we would love to get accomplished, but when it's heard from a parent at the district level, it happens quite quickly as compared to from teacher voices. And just, I know this is a big question, but any, why, any theories? That, I think that was what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. I think we need to ask why. Mm -hmm. Why are our children coming dysregulated? What's going on? We know about the traumas. What's going on in our community? What's going on with families? How's their health? Are they getting enough to eat? Are they getting exercise? Are they having their mental uh, and emotional health uh, needs met? Do they have the vocabulary? Do they have the tools to say, I'm scared, I'm angry, I'm upset? And then what do you do with those tools? What do you say, okay, how can I get myself back to where I'm ready to learn? But ask, we do need to have some deep um, looking into why. And this is not just a Portland problem. You know, having, having taught in a different state and knowing many educators that now teach in Portland from other states, this is absolutely not no, an isolated no, issue. This no. is something that's been coming down the pipeline for a long time and it's happening everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're seeing so many teacher strikes fighting for our kids because we need more. And you said, um, Jenny, you said it feels so good to talk. Oh my goodness, yes. I just feel like we've got this community of us and we're all nodding our heads probably, mm -hmm. you know, in unison. It's so exactly. validating. Mm -hmm. Validating. Because yeah. it's a common lived experience. You're yes. all yes, it going is. through this. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's important to remember it's not a teacher problem or a school problem, but it's a community right. problem. And as a community, whether it's the local community, whatever city we live in, or the state community, we need to come together and figure out a solution to this because, again, we just want our students to be successful. And these are our kids. These are, these are our kids, and these are, the, these are the people that are going to be taking care of us when we're older. These are the people that are going to be inventing all sorts of amazing things. I mean, we we need to, this is our problem. It's not just a school problem, it's not just a teacher problem, it's our Society. collective societal mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm.